as well. Uh, so there'll be some people following this on live stream. Hi um, everyone on live stream. I'm just going to get the board a bit better. Uh, okay. So I believe Svidler's through, and even the inventory match isn't decided yet. But even uh, but Peter Svidler is through. Uh, so let's have a look at his recent wins in the World Cup. I thought they would be interesting. I think his play. Um, it, he's a great Grunfield defense player. So some of the games are Grunfield defense as black. Um, here is a game though with the white pieces uh, against, I believe, one of the top Chinese grandmasters, Nguyen. Nguyen, Nguyen uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Nguyen, anyway. Um, but let's have a look at this. So I think this was in a tie-breaking uh, rapid because it was round 2.5. Um, so he kicked off with e4 actually. Uh, so he's um, 2739 at the time of this game, and his opponent was 2637. So he played e4, and his opponent played the French defense, so e6. Okay, so what did he do? He played now uh, d4. And after d5, he chose actually the advance variation of the French defense. He played um, e5. All right. So black usually tries to strike at the center here uh, by playing for c5. And, and usually, you know, knight c6 and then queen b6. That's the kind of strategy usually uh, in the advance variation. So black does carry on with, with c5 here and um, he just supports the pawn chain now with c3 um, okay and black carries on putting pressure on that d4 pawn okay it's all very logical for black very neat um, now so uh, okay um, so now how does black carry on putting um, the pressure on well actually after knight f3 black chose quite an interesting move now a bit controversial in, in that it's inviting structural damage so we can say that d4 is usually queen b6 is a sort of fairly standard move or there's a waiting move actually by max uva a former world champion bishop d7 I think Uva's waiting move it was basically known as Bishop D7. But here Black actually chose a different move, uh, which is quite interesting and maybe quite dynamic um, if Black can pull it off. So the move uh, chosen was Knight H6, uh, which does of course invite Bishop takes H6. Um, in this position actually, Peter decided not to take on h6 immediately uh, he plays actually just bishop d3 and there's an implication of bishop d3 then if uh, knight f5 may maybe he'll just snap it off on f5 um, here black chose c takes d4 and now for some reason i wonder if we can discern why but um why now and only now chose bishop takes h6 um i guess black has released you know the tension in the center with c takes d4 um oh, a question on live stream lord osiris why would he rather lose a good bishop than a bad one hmm well he's still got the bishop on d3 here um you know, is this bishop bad? I think they were both reasonably good, actually, on these two diagonals. So let's see what happens. G takes um, h6. Oh, you say on knight f5, yeah. So if, if uh, say, knight f5, well, I'm not 100% sure, actually, that bishop takes f5 would be played here. You know, not 100% sure. Um, maybe you know there's other moves 
Okay, so it's it's quite complex, really, the French defense. But there seems to be a subtlety here to provoke bishop takes h6. Tonzo write, uh, writes that the knights can go to c3 now. I see. So yes, because because he knows c takes d4 will provide c3. Maybe he's convinced more about bishop takes h6 being a good idea here. Okay, so takes c takes d4. So the knight is given the c3 square. And what would be the significance of that? I mean, I guess knight e2 to f4 to h5 <laughs> is one maneuver, which seems to pop up later in the game. Because uh, this is a good square in front of double pawns, as Nimzovic would say. If you want a knight blockade, of, often in front of double pawns, it's quite effective to create a knight blockade. Okay, so black here plays queen b6. Now there's no immediate threat of, of taking on d4 because of that standard, you know, tactic, bishop b5 check, uh, springing an attack on the queen. So no problem with d4 at the moment. Queen d2, eyeing h6, saying to the bishop, you know, if you do move over here, once, well, there's an issue at the moment on b2, but maybe one day queen h6 is gonna be useful, one day. So bishop d7, and now bishop e2, putting support on that pawn, which is now indirectly attacked. And the bishop on f8, now it goes to g7. So keeping guard of the g7 pawn. And later, you know, maybe black can try and extend the scope of the bishop and undermine the chain from e5. But the knight is given a nice square here, knight c3. So at the moment, white's position looks fairly um, good, uh, but black has, you know, the bishop pair. Uh, what does white have? Um, well, white maybe uh, has got a stable, you know, pawn structure here. Um, okay, so black castled and, and white's also castled here. And now I guess black was looking uh, perhaps at this f5 square. That's sometimes classic to use. This knight e7 has the implication that either knight f5 to put pressure like that, or maybe even knight g6 might be useful. Okay, so after bishop d3, um, it's eyeing h7, but is this really going to be the case of Peter playing bishop? Bishop back and queen d3 to increase increase the battery. Was that a pointless idea? After king h8, actually this knight maneuver um, comes in now. Knight e2. So this looks like a neat knight maneuver to aim for, to strike at that bishop, and maybe to threaten knight f6. So here the move bishop b5 is played, and actually okay. Usually in the advanced variation of the French exchanging off the light square bishops is usually a bad idea for white because you know of these weak you know squares um, but here what's the big difference here if white does take on b5 what other dynamics are there in the position well there is that knight maneuver uh, to consider um, well, let's see. So he did take on b5. So we have some slightly weakened, you know, light squares. But uh, what are white's trump cards? This knight maneuver can be activated now. Knight f4. Okay, so this knight is going for a juicy square, h5. Black actually decides here, not knight f5, which might be tempting, but actually knight g6 which I suppose puts pressure on e5. So maybe f6 is the idea behind knight g6. So knight h5, which also kind of puts a restraint on f6, you know, taking and the knights also on f6, but also the queens on h6. So it's impractical at the moment to play for f6. So where is black's counterplay here? Okay. Um, Okay, so black's counterplay. <clears throat> Possibly on 
the G file, uh, you know, later, you, you would imagine. But I suppose on the C file, there's also potential, you know, entry points or, or usage points. The queen is putting a bit of pressure on the queen side. Okay, so black actually plays rook ac8 here. And white challenges uh, the rook with rook ac1. Uh, so inviting a rook exchange. Queen d7 now is played, which releases uh, some pressure on a5. You know, maybe this will be useful potentially. I don't know. That might be the weakness of the last move. It was on, you know, the queen side. Okay, but actually white keeps the queen on d2. It's it's attacking that sensitive h6 pawn at the moment. White actually just continues with h4. Okay. So now rook takes c1, rook takes c1, exchange of rooks, and after rook c8, white now deprives black of you know the f4 square by playing uh, g3 so black's been deprived of the f4 square and white is also inviting the further exchange of rooks but white would be structurally better Remember black's got the double pawns here um so okay rook c6 is played and Pete doesn't mind. He doesn't mind this simplification. He takes on c6. So White's still got this nagging edge, um, it seems, structurally. But his next move is also quite interesting. It's another potential uh, knight maneuver on the cards. Bishop Powell says, why does Queen take better the, the b pawn? Well, if b takes, we're, we're introducing an isolated pawn here. And you know maybe a move like Queen B4 would be quite powerful, threatening things like this potentially. Of course, not at the moment. The bishop's guarding F8, but this does mean structural damage, and maybe also B4 would fix down against C5. So possibly, you know, he wanted to keep the pawns uh, intact here by playing Queen takes C6. So Queen takes C6. Now this Knight H2, as if maybe you know Knight G4 to f6 or just attacking h6 coordinated attack on h6 here so um sorry yeah um tonzo on on chess base writes knight h2 to g4 yes that looks like the idea okay so knight e7 is played which might parry knight g4 now with knight f5 to protect the pawn okay so queen f4 is played hitting actually f7 and knight f5 blocks that attack but now the knight's kicked out of the way remember this is rapid so maybe black's already blundered here g4 would seem to be very very dangerous in this position to win that f7 pawn so possibly black's already blundered he plays queen c2 and i suppose this is a cheapo tactic you know queen d1 check to win the knight. Once g takes, that knight will be loose. But uh, Peter blocks that diagonal. He plays actually knight f3. So in effect, renewing that threat of taking on f7. And in fact, where is the knight going now? It goes back to e7, losing f7. Uh, now, black is in dire straits because the knights and e8 are quite bad simultaneous threats remember this is rapid so i think black's lost the thread here it's a lost position he plays queen g6 and it's all pretty gloomy now white simply just takes on e7 allowing queen g4 check but now just plays king h2 and if either knight is taken then if this knight's taken then queen d8 check avoiding obviously e8 will be winning you know next move will be mate and if queen takes f3 then actually actually here there's queen takes g7 so this final position whenever knight is chosen black's had it um so that was quite a neat game in the world cup as with the white pieces 
Uh, let's review in summary, do a review and summary of that game. So French defense showing there's some venom with you know the advanced variation of the French. So the advanced variation where black uh, tried for an interesting idea with knight h6 but it does suffer structurally and it seems uh, white's play was quite effective to exploit you know the double pawns here but interestingly he didn't take immediately he played bishop d3 and only after cd so he knows he's going to get the c3 square for the knight now 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 it's where he took on h6 so cd and he can get this position with the queen on d2 now and the knight on c3 so that's what he aims for and now bishop d3 as though there might be some threats brewing with a battery on this diagonal but black prevents that with a quick b5 very soon here so any battery ideas have gone here with you know the queen and bishop um, so was black doing well though after this light square exchange it seems not white's got enough still to play with in the position so knight f4 goes to h5 after rook a c8 peter doesn't mind the exchange of rooks here as we saw and further exchange of rooks coming up and basically he just maneuvers the other knight decisively in effect big threat of knight g4 this knight f5 wasn't enough it seems black cannot rely on just a single cheapo check to stay out of trouble here after knight f3 black is in big trouble and um, after queen f7 it's basically it's gone the position's just gone now after check here whatever knight's taken it's it's end of game okay so that was an interesting i think game to look at first let's look at another game now of peter i hope you got something out of that game in the advanced variation of the french advanced french um so let's have a look now with the black pieces against you know the same opponents now this time uh peter's been using um the groomfield defense with great effect and this is actually a groomfield defense game let's actually flip the board so groomfield defense is uh you know one of the products of the hypermoderns to try and blow up the white center later invite white to take the center a little bit but here the quick d5 is a bit less radical than the king's engine defense um, and there's going to be strikes with c5 usually now here this bishop g5 is an interesting variation and even more so the way white played it maybe specifically prepared for faster time controls so knight e4 is a logical response um now if you know knight takes then d takes and white uh, is faced with pressure on d4 pretty soon so white actually played h4 which maybe is, is a bit of a novel move here in this position uh, you know sort of infrequently played h4 sort of simon williams move actually it's a, it's a creative move <laughs> Um, so is it going to be a hacker attack if black takes you know we can have some sort of tactical dynamism going on maybe <clears throat> but black actually just calmly peter just calmly plays bishop g7 which maybe is in the spirit of things he doesn't want any major attacks on his king he's offering d5 of course here because there is pressure on d5 and d5 is taken but he's, he's collecting that pawn back. He takes on c3 and collects it back. So e3 is now played. That's another pawn on the dark square. So we've got two pawns on the dark square, preventing reverse of the bishop. Uh, so knight d7 is played now. So delaying castling, and we've got either the strike with c5 or e5 available for black to sort of undermine this triangle of pawns either c5 or e5 
So knight f3 is played here. Now queen a5 immediately asking the question what to do with the c pawn. Actually, white ignores the c pawn, he just plays bishop d3. I think black's not really threatening to take it because I think white would gain the dangerous initiative, just, just king here. And then later, you know, rook c1. It could could be dangerous down the c file. I expect that's the reason. Um, so actually, Peter just kicked the bishop here. He played h6. Okay. After bishop f4, he strikes in the center, e5. Now, if white ever takes with d takes, it couldn't be, could be embarrassing later on the d file. Once once one of these rooks, you know, reaches d8, it's going to be nice. So bishop g3, keeping this solid triangle of pawns intact. So e takes d4, e takes d4, and now both sides castle. So Peter castles and his opponent castles. And now knight f6. And it looks as though black is doing fine here. This pawn looks a bit strange. It's, you know, it could have been used here to protect g4. And now bishop g4 might be possible. Knight g4 or knight h5. It looks a bit strange, this h4 in this position. But remember, this is just the rapid game. Uh, queen c2 is played. And now bishop f5. So not minding, uh, you know, maybe bishop takes, queen takes. Uh, and if queen takes t takes black will have a good grip on e4 white doesn't want to do that it seems white played rook fb1 trying to keep some pressure going on the queen side but just b6 here okay white does have the e5 square which he uses now knight e5 and now we get an exchange of light square bishops because now there's a big threat of bishop f5 anyway because the the knight's been you know shielding away from the queen, so bishop takes d3, and now queen d5. So this queen looks nice in the center, as if it might be sporting c5 and also maybe queen e4 and also knight e4 maybe. All these possibilities. Queen d5 looks like a nice move, but is it subject to an attack? Well, this is the question posed now. Rook b5 just attacking the queen, but now c5. Okay. Black seems to have a comfortable position um, here. Um, sorry, Tonzo writes, you don't want a knight on c3 in the advanced French. Oh, sorry, that was from the previous game. Okay, in this, in here, you know, Black's got a comfortable game. Um, and White has, what is the rook really doing on b5? Well, the other rook goes to e1. Are the rooks really working together? I'm not sure. Now, also, is this pawn sacrifice really justified? Actually, the question is asked, it's, it's taken here, it's taken. So white takes on c5, regaining the pawn. But now this default issue rears its head. You know, this is a very nice default and coordinated pieces on d2. Queen f3. But now a pin, actually, rook d5 pinning that c pawn to the rook. And not only that, there's pressure on e5, which can be further amplified with another pin, and then maybe the knight moving. Okay. So knight c6 is played here. So immediately threatening knight e7 check. So what does Peter do? He just takes on c5. Off the rook bb1. Now knight d5 is played. So knight d5 attacks c3, extends the scope of the bishop. c6 and c3 are under fire. In fact, the queen is supporting uh, d5. Okay. Queen supporting d5. So black seems to be doing quite well here. Knight e5 is played, and now black snaps up the c3 pawn. It looks as though white's being dismantled actually after this. The rook's forced to move. 
So black is at the moment two pawns up. So he doesn't mind the exchange of queens, but that's avoided. Now h5 again, quick kicking the queen. And now rook e8, and all of a sudden, you know, what is this knight doing here? So white's queen is also a bit pathetic over there. And black is like two pawns up. And here actually, white either lost on time or just resigned. I'm not sure which actually. I don't know if any of you guys know for sure, but it's not one here. So that seemed to be an easy to play. He made the Grunfeld look easy to play anyway in this creation. He avoided the dynamism on the H file. Uh, so let's check that out again in overview and summary. So Grunfeld with this Bishop G5 and the surprise move H4. Okay, so he simply focuses on the center and, and the D4 pressure. So he gets pressure on d4 again. And he's going to strike, maybe, uh, to undermine that pawn chain very soon. And he strikes with e5. Pardon me. Strikes with e5. Okay. Bishop retreats. He weakened white center. Both sides castled. So knight f6 now. And it seems, you know, black is really comfortable here. After queen c2, um, he doesn't mind exchanges. He'd get better control of e4 after this if bishop f5 and queen f5. So actually, um, he seems to have a very comfortable position now after the exchange of light square bishops. The light squares in white's position look a bit suspect actually here. Um, Okay, why not c4? It looks good, Bishop Powell writes. Yeah, c4, well, maybe queen e4 simply, and then black can look forward to pressure on, on the d-pawn, maybe. So I think queen e4, it's just, it's just about the center being a bit weak. There's also moves like knight h5 to consider later, you know, hitting that bishop, putting pressure on e5. You want d4 to be reliably quite solid, so playing a move like c4 might weaken d4 considerably. Uh, so instead, this rook b5, c5. But again, d4 has been you know, on the firing line. This pawn sacrifice didn't seem to do much. It was accepted. And black got defile pressure. And this key move, I think key move is played, rook d5. So it's preventing any damage with this pawn, any further damage. Pinning that, putting more pressure on the knight. Seems to be a, a very nice move, rook d5. Okay. So, knight c6, and now just snapping up that pawn. Leaves black two pawns, no, one pawn up at the moment. Sorry, pardon me. But soon to be after knight d5, two pawns up, because what can be done about c3? It can't be moved forward. It's another pawn biting the dust. Completely biting the dust. Oh, hi, Chess Explained. Hi. Why it was nicely outplayed, it seems, uh, Chess Explained writes, who's Fina 2400, by the way. Um, so, uh, yeah. it's It seems very comfortably played, Grunfeld. Uh, so, knight e5. So, two pawns up. Um, pretty miserable. And the queen's re-centralizing now, queen d5. And in order to avoid the queen exchange, the white queen's put in a terrible spot now. Off to h5, queen h3. And now rook e8 is pretty nasty. In fact, if the knight moves in this final position, uh, possibly knight e2 check, just like winning the exchange, actually. So possibly that's one of the reasons why white resigned here. If the knight retreated, knight e2 check. So the knight's got nowhere else really um, to go. F4 looks unpalatable here. Again, possibly knight e2 check, because if takes, then there's queen d4 check. Um, and if, if he doesn't, um, you know, this looks terrible anyway. Um, so maybe there's, there's lots of possibilities here. 
Um, not sure what the most decisive continuation would be. Uh, okay, but uh, it, it's two pawns down anyway, and it looks pretty dire. So uh, let's have a look at another game of Peter's Vidler. Okay. Um, let's load up another game. So against the youngster Caruana, one of the young, you know, super GMs, he's two seven three nine. Sorry, not two. Peter's Vidler's two seven three nine, but Caruana's two seven one one. One of the younger, you know, super grandmasters over twenty seven hundred. So Peter's Vidler's black again and faces an annoying Catalan system in this game. So uh, d4 after knight f6, c4, okay, but now Catalan, g3, okay. Um, so Peter plays d5. Chess Explained writes, there's a funny story here, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'll relay it if you can. So, Zvid made a finger fella with e6. Fin. Oh. <laughs> a what? <laughs> finger slip? Uh huh. Oh, mate. All oh, right, he didn't mean to play d5. e6. We didn't mean to be play e6. Interesting. Okay, touch wrong piece. That's funny. He wanted g6 as usual. Yes, I'm wondering why he's playing like this and not the sort of Grunfeld setup with g6. Hmm. Interesting. Um, okay, so knight f3, so he's in Catalan territory. All right, so d takes c4. Is black in for a long torture? Black strikes immediately the center with c5. And again, we've got the d4 story, pressure on d4 all the time. It's a key central square for black, often d4, across the various systems, just to put pressure on d4. Okay, so d takes c5, boring, boring, offering exchange of queens. But is white aiming for a nagging advantage? So the exchange of queens is, is accepted. Bishop takes c5. We have a symmetrical kind of pawn structure. If white regains this pawn, um, then we have two pawns here and two pawns there, and it's symmetrical. But white has this persistent bishop across the diagonal. This bishop's a bit inferior to this one. So knight d2, but now an interesting move is played. Well, when I say interesting, it's all relative um, to fracture the white pawn structure here. But Hack Thomas writes, why can't white take the bishop at move 16? Uh, to double pawns. Um, oh, sorry, that was that a previous game. Pardon me. Oh, uh, I think we're a game behind there. So we haven't reached move 16. Pardon me, heck. Sorry. Can you post that on YouTube? This will be up on YouTube uh, later. Maybe you'd, you'd want to post the question there. When I upload it to YouTube, please use the comments section there. So YouTube.com Kings Crusher. It will be it will be on YouTube later, this broadcast. So please ask any further questions there. That would be great. But here c3 is is um, used, uh, giving up the pawn in style, fracture at least white's pawn structure. So b takes c3, which means you know the c file is not going to be that brilliant. It's blocked by its own pawn. So the bishop's shielded from a later c file attack. This pawn could be getting away of this bishop. So bishop d7. Of the knight b3, the bishop goes actually back to e7. What may be tempting bishop b6 but then bishop a3 striking across that diagonal so the bishop wants to keep control of a3 i think by coming back to e7 c4 is played now and now castles is safe enough to play bishop b2 and now rook fd8 so black looks a bit on the passive side for the moment, but his position is probably solid enough. Rook a c8, taking the pressure on c6, no big deal at the moment. Knight b5, as though picking up the light, the dark square bishop, possibly trying to play knight d6. Maybe there's a threat of bishop takes c6, you know, if bishop c6, knight takes a7. 
Um, but actually, bishop e8 is played here. Okay. Actually, in this position, bishop c6 wouldn't work, just taking, and if the knight would be trapped, because the bishop would be protecting, so it would be just trapped on a7. Uh, so that's out of the question. c5 is played. Black trades rooks. Now knight d8 hitting that poor knight on b5. If knight takes a7, then, then rook traps the knight, you know, rook a8. Uh, so the knight goes to d6, which seems good to try and pick up the dark square bishop. This bishop's, you know, nice on the diagonal. So picking up this guy would seem like a good idea. Bishop takes d6. C takes d6. Um, so doesn't white look a little bit better here? He's got these fine looking, you know, x-ray bishops, right? He's got this pawn on d6. He's got a knight which can potentially be useful, but not at the moment. But black's got the c file. Black's got a nice bishop now which can come to useful squares. Maybe this pawn isn't such a major thing because it's kind of blocked at the moment anyway. It's not going anywhere. So bishop a4 is first used. Now rook d2 and knight block blockades the pawn. Ah. Chess explains, uh, right, Swidler himself said that white is much better. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this this was a rapid game, wasn't it? Anyway, this, this was 3.4. This is one of the rapid games, wasn't it? Um, I think. 3.4. Okay, so F4. Um, F6. So f4 keeps black pieces out of the game. King f2, king f8, g4, white's gaining a bit of space, b6. So black's waiting to see what white's going to do. g5, okay, so g5, trying to extend the scope of the bishop on the diagonal. Seems like a logical idea. After fg, fg. Now e5, blunting the bishop at the cost of weakening d5. So this bishop's kind of potentially good. But the pawn's useful on e5 because also knight e6 or knight f7. This pawn could be a target. h4 is played. There's another issue now with h4 though, that this pawn is slightly weak on this for this kind of attack, which is now used rook c4. I think black's slipping back into the game here with peace play myself so king g7 now bishop c6 trying to weaken you know these light squares and if if the bishop pair can be removed that's less danger for black probably bishop h3 king e8 e3 now g6 so these pawns seem a bit fixed at the moment okay Black's rook's active. This bishop's kind of nice. So black seems to have got back in the game. He's also blunted this bishop a bit. Um, the tactic bishop takes d7 and bishop e5 doesn't seem that tempting um, at the moment. Uh, okay, so actually white plays bishop g4. And now bishop e4, as though Bishop f5 might be on the cards, or rook c2. So bishop e2, actually rook c8, rook goes back to c8. Bishop b5, so there's still pressure on black. And this creates the threat of bishop takes e5, that pin. That e pawn's protected now, knight f7, protecting the e pawn. Bishop a3. Okay, a6, trying to unpin. Now a5, not minding the bishop going back to b5, it seems. Which the bishop does return to b5. Interestingly, now, a4, tactical, nice tactical move to drive the knight. Um, because if bishop takes a4, maybe, um, you know, rook a8. 
because uh, then if bishop takes king takes is still on that and um, it might be uncomfortable for white in that position uh, fairly uncomfortable so white didn't want to um, commit to that bishop takes d7 here white instead um, sorry chess explain whites this might be okay now knight b3 is really bad for instance okay so he moves the knight actually to c1 is bishop takes d7 a terrible move uh, chess explained king takes of oh, the knight would have to move somewhere horrible it's it's just not good uh, no actually it can't can't no can't do that knight a1 is disgusting no no it can't do that so um just knight c1 with the with, um, the bishop still protecting okay uh rook c3 though and these guys are now forked so black's better now chess explains reckons black's better as well so bishop b4 and um that blunders a piece it seems <laughs> a piece is going off that rook takes c1 that's end of game it was a rapid game can't expect too much from rapid but uh, white was seemingly gradually outplayed uh, let's have a look at that so if you're faced against the Catalan this might be a game you might think about um, to how to sort of there's some finesses here like you know taking the opportunity uh, to play c3 here and keeping the bishop on e7 to avoid bishop a3s from white um, there's this idea coming up of it doesn't really matter perhaps that there's a pawn on d6 if it's blockadable easily blockadable the blunting of the dark square bishop is one episode later now afforded by g5 so when black took he could blunt that bishop on b2 uh, this rook activity was interesting the king coming in the center also helped black's pieces be a bit freer then there's this interesting episode tactically here of a6 and a5 coming up so a6 a5 a4 interesting episode for for rook a8 uh, being useful um, but no the main thing is this this knight um, sorry bishop takes pawn first actually let's just check that is, is rook a8 still powerful here Need to check that with an engine actually. What what's the story here? Probably just rook rook a8. Okay. But he didn't do that. He played knight c1. And white got into real trouble now after rook c3. He gave up basically. He played he just played bishop before. Maybe he was in severe time pressure. So he's blundered the piece. Rook takes c1. End of game. So interesting game there with black. So he's winning, able to win with black at a very high level against 2700 plus opposition. Okay. So let's look at another game. Now, unfortunately, uh, you know, one of my favorite players was knocked out by Peter Zbidler, Judith Polgar. So she's back in the game. She's an exciting, dynamic, great for the image of the game. It was brilliant. I, I enjoyed Judith Polgar getting that far but she's now you know she unfortunately uh, this was the key game <laughs> um, where uh, she stumbled in in one of the long games the second uh, long game the first one was drawn she drew the first game and this was the key long game the second one which unfortunately if she didn't draw to be knocked out unfortunately okay we'll take the black side um depressing depressing poor judith she's got a facebook page by the way if you want to visit it and um yeah okay so e4 sicilian defense c5 the princess of chess actually is the kind of strap line of her facebook page yeah i guess she is she's the number one woman in the world anyway at the moment uh okay so knight f3 <laughs> d6 so we have Nidorf territory very popular bishop e3 now 
e6 okay now in these lines black probably usually wants to preserve the bishop on c8 because sometimes if black's later force for e5 d5 is going to be weaker if that's the case you want to keep your light square bishop and also what to do with this knight this is a little bit of a finesse to consider do you want the knight here or do you want it here the thing is with being here later that might be useful for knight c5 which might work with b5 bishop b7 to bear pressure on e4 so these little finesses in this variation are interesting to consider and also the delaying of you know the bishop and, and castling is interesting to consider so b5 okay so black might aim for this setup with the bishop here the knight here the queen here the knight coming to c5 later with pressure on e4 so queen f3 bishop b7 bishop d3 and now the knight to d7 so not developing not not trying to cancel too quickly and in fact after white consoles just rook c8 so he's keeping solid here for the moment and reacting to f5 by playing e5 so he's slightly weak in d5 but it's not a problem at the moment because he's got that light square bishop to give up if necessary if if there's a knight d5 from white so knight retreats now knight c5 now does white want to give up the dark square bishop probably not it leads to dark square issues later and also there might be d takes anyway and then c4 as well as rook takes there's d takes so um rook d1 b4 encouraging knight d5 but where else the knights here is also stopping any knight a4 it's not going to retreat it's too miserable for that so it goes to d5 which might have the advantage after after this move to give white the e4 square to work with so bishop d5 but here actually white judith didn't just take on d5 she took perhaps um because there's a big tactical problem it seems if she if she takes like this then there's e4 how embarrassing what's the queen doing there in this variation e4 would be winning a piece here so it's actually unfortunately here it seems as though she's um forced to play bishop c5 ouch so she's going to have dark square issue problems uh, rook takes c5 ed and in fact she's dropping the d pawn here it seems uh, black can afford to take the d pawn uh, there's no major discovered check issue here after rook takes d5 okay can she fight back from this position she's just a pawn down the center pawn and they say center pawns are worth a lot if you can get away with you know nicking center pawns you get the central control later so they're worth you know considering um if you're going to win a pawn you know the center pawns but is white has white got an initiative is white going to use the e4 square well knight g3 as if it's potential you know for e4 square use but this knight's guarding e4 at the moment rook c5 okay so the knight actually does go into e4 now and we we reach a scenario where maybe white's aiming for a light square blockade and grip and opposite colored bishops might increase the drawing chances so knight e4 bishop e4 so it could be difficult for black to win this opposite colored bishops white sitting on d5 quite comfortably now with this battery so maybe judith was just hoping to draw from this position even though she's a pawn down okay after bishop e7 she can stop black casting with check it's not such a big deal though bishop d5 is the light square blockade enough oh rook takes c2 here i don't think that's possible because of queen b3 that would be hitting f7 okay so bishop f6 now bishop b3 protecting c2 queen b6 and also this bishop f6 means that there's no f6 which means the king might actually consider going to e7 as well pretty soon in fact here the king does go to e7 which means the rooks now free to come out so black's pretty solid in the center and the rooks also free to come into the game to either of these squares rook d5 now queen c6 
an exchange of rooks occurs and now rook c8 so okay white's trying to maybe just keep things stable uh Zundiver writes the time control is 25 10 okay 25 minutes and 10 second increments per move okay h6 so there's no magical tactic to save white here like queen f7 it doesn't quite work queen f7 uh so what does white do rook a5 okay it does does mean that there is the threat of queen f7 though now so how is that parried rook f8 Queen e2 back attacking a6 that's protected h3 now rook a7 is played so rook a7 what's happening here the queen e3 rook c7 Rook d5. So maybe White's thinking this is going to be a draw. What? Why is Pip playing on? Give me a draw. Maybe that's what she's thinking. She's got. Has she got a strong enough light square blockade? She's got a strong grip on d5, and it's opposite color bishops. Could not, you know, Black draw this. Um, well, Bishop g5 after Queen f3. Now Queen b6. So there's a bit of coordination actually on this square. From these two guys, and but this pawn, you know, it needs it needs like a rook behind it to get going. If this pawn's ever going to get going, other than that, what's Black's winning plan here? Chess explain White's White's Black squares are the issue. Yeah, this bishop's a bit passive, isn't it, compared to this bishop? Sometimes the opposite color bishops can help attacks. Black's a pawn up. It's a center pawn up. It's the e pawn, but can the e pawn actually be made use of here? Okay. Rook d1. Now queen c6, struggling that control of the center, not minding the exchange of queens, obviously. Queen decentralizes back, but it does threaten, you know, queen f7 again. But now a nifty defense of f7 here, just the king moves to un unveil the protection. Of f7 so we have a scenario now where black is starting to regroup you know maybe rook e7 then e4 e3 so rook d5 the pawn is running e4 it's going down it's 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 bad something has increased is increasable the past pawn is, is meant to be pushed so queen e2 e3 increasing pressure now even though it's opposite color bishops starting to look a bit passive uh, for white so rook d4 and now a5 is though now all of a sudden not only protecting that pawn but a4 might be a threat and then maybe b3 and smashing down the c file and then bishop f4 if check you know that really dangerous threats are starting to emerge here after a5 h4 judith lost control bishop power right so bishop f6 now there's a skewer. Is this going to like win the b2 pawn? But what about e3? So rook c4 is played here. Now this walks into a pin rook c4, but what else was there? Interesting. Rook c4 just walking into a pin with queen a6. So the rook's now immobilized. It's unpinned actually with queen g4. But now back to this past pawn to be pushed. Rook e7 threatening e2. What's going on here with this, this dangerous pawn? Rook e4. But now horrible check, nasty check. Queen f1. And this 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 opposite color bishop asset when, when you've got the attack comes into play. Bishop e5, really weak dark squares. And this is forcibly like winning now after g3 check and now a tactical blow bishop takes g3 threatens two things the rook and threatens mate and if queen takes g3 then take the queen off then take the rook exchange up for nothing and it's game over 
it's a shame it's it's a shame it's how Judith got knocked out I guess we should do an overview and summary uh, to wrap up of this game so it's how to play the, the Sicilian Nidorf it's um requires dynamic play from black sometimes not castling as this game demonstrates pressure on e4 even winning a center pawn and just gradually outplaying uh, Judith from a position where it looked initially as though white had a strong grip over the light squares in the center but that grip was somehow it, it collapsed at some point um, actually I'm just I don't think any tactic worked here on f7 um, so just protecting without this a6 business so a key maneuver perhaps was rook a7 because it meant you know f7 and once the king moves the rook can come to e7 um, so the e pawns the big asset for black which is gradually unveiled now as as kind of the winning asset in this game um, this was a nasty pin perhaps white has better than rook c4 if white just played rook d3 i'm not is is black still winning does anyone know did it have to go down the way it did after rook d3 well rook d3 actually pardon me rook d3 would allow bishop takes h4 which doesn't look too too hot hmm so rook c4 walking into a pin for a, for a moment but now this back to this e pawn and at the side of the game this nasty check and then bishop e5 another nasty check so it's the dark squares which lead to a little neat combination at the end okay um well i hope you got something from any of those games or all of those games i'm going to put this video on youtube soon uh, so it'll be there in about an hour so youtube.com kings crush if you want to leave comments there i'm also doing um i did a few other videos recently evolution of chess style alexander alakine um okay so um any comments or questions on this week or um otherwise you know thanks very much and see you next week okay or leave them on YouTube. Thanks so much. Okay.